Ford. We'll get back to him uh, as the situation is needed here on CNN. But then there's the breaking news. Uh, Andrew Gillum. Uh, wins the Democratic, Florida Democratic primary for governor. First African American. There he is. Um, it is an upset. No one, it's a surprise. No one thought that this would happen pretty much. But I guess he did because he was in the race and also those uh, who were supporting him as well. One of them was uh, Senator Bernie, Bernie Sanders, who was, who actually campaigned for him, endorsed him, putting out a statement. Let me read the statement before I bring in some folks to talk about it. Uh, Bernie Sanders said, congratulations to Andrew Gillum on his victory tonight. What has made Andrew's campaign so powerful is that he is not just working hard to win an election. He says he has laid out a vision for a new course for for the state of Florida and our country, no person can take on the economic and political elites on their own. Tonight, Floridians joined Andrew in standing up and demanding change in their community. That's what the political revolution is all about, and Andrew Gillum is helping to lead it. That said, CNN political analyst April Ryan is here, and CNN politics senior writer and analyst Harry Enton. Both are here as well. Uh, good evening to both of you. April, I just I want to get to you. Harry, you know, I saw you earlier yeah. speaking about this, but April, I want to get to you. Um, you know, we've got you've got Stacey Abrams, right, uh, right across yes, uh, the border in yes. Georgia, Georgia. And now you have in yeah. Florida, um, you've got Andrew Gillum as well. What does this say to you? The South shall rise again for some. Uh, it's very interesting. For all intents and purposes in this Trump era, this should not be. Two African Americans in red states, the reddest of states, rising to the top and could possibly wind up getting the governorship of these states. And, and, and not just, you don't just have them there. You also have Ben Jealous in Maryland. Um, you have you have so many uh, minorities running for office now for once again a time such as this. Um, I think back to uh, when George W. Bush and Al Gore were fighting over who was going to be president. Florida was pivotal. It went to George W. Bush. Yeah. I think about Florida for Donald Trump. Now look at it. Is it going to be purple? Will and, and, and I talked to Stacey Abrams a few uh, weeks ago uh, during the summer at Essence, at the Essence Festival, and she said, you know, she doesn't look at Georgia as necessarily red. She looks at it as purple. So for a time such as this, as, as this president is trying to hold on to his base, there is this, this, this quiet movement of going to the polls, of people going to the polls saying, this is what we want. We want change, too. Mm -hmm. So let's see who wins out in this fight. But once again, I find it so interesting, you know, how we talk about the South. But some have said the South shall rise again, but in a different way. Yeah. Um, Harry, let's bring Harry into And Harry, you have a Trump supporter now, DeSantos, uh, versus a black progressive, obviously progressive uh, of the Bernie Sanders ilk, right? Unapologetic. How does that play out in Florida, of all places? I mean, look, I don't know if there's a greater contrast in the nation between Canada candidates than in the Florida gubernatorial race. Now, I mean, arguably, perhaps up in Georgia, maybe there is. But I think that both sides got the candidate that they wanted the other side to get. So we're going to have to wait and see. But I think in this Trump era, you're dealing with a black progressive candidate on the left, and you're dealing with a Trump supporter on the right. And it's not clear in a midterm election with the national environments on the Democratic side whether or not the Democrats could get that extra little point or plus that Trump won by in Florida to overcome that Republican advantage. But keep this in mind. In Florida, they have not elected a Democratic governor since 1994. So that's the uphill battle that Gillum is facing. But also keep in mind that they really haven't nominated a true progressive on the Democratic side since long before 1994. So this is a different tack that the Florida Democratic electorate is taking. They've decided to go to the left. They've decided to go with an African-American candidate. And I will say, if you get the turnout among African-Americans and young progressives that Gillum got tonight down in Florida, it will make for a very interesting general election campaign. You set me up for my next question uh, really well, uh, April, because it, Florida's always super competitive. I'm going to let you get in here because uh, this is along the lines, I'm sure, of what you're going to talk about. Um, there's huge electoral play uh, in, in Florida. National implications here. Go on, April. You know, I, I this is a different time. You know, we didn't expect many people, you know, the internal polls for Donald Trump, he felt that he was going to win and he did win. A lot of the pollsters did not think that it was going to happen and it happened. This is a different day. And I'm going to go back to those people in that black belt that uh, 
told Roy Moore we didn't want him. They said, we don't want you. And I think that was a telltale sign. What happened in Alabama, um, and people are saying, you know, we don't want this, or some people are saying we want this. There's a quiet movement going on in this nation, in the churches, in the uh, HBCU community, uh, historically black colleges and universities community, and in many of the, the black Greek organizations uh, and the links and, and other organizations that are getting people to the polls to vote. And they're saying, you know, there are things on the table, like the NAACP, they're saying, you know, vote against hate. That's their theme. So they're getting people to the polls. And I understand, you know, the black vote is not as large as the mainstream vote. But those numbers are coming out and showing that they are a force. And you, once again, you have something that we have never seen before happening in Florida. And possibly uh, it could it could change the dynamic of, of Florida politics and national politics and what's happening in Georgia. So there is a quiet movement, Don, uh, to, to, to go up against what this president is doing. Yeah. You know, you know what, what's interesting to me is, and I just want to read something here, um, Harry, because he talked about, he gave, he's been giving interviews, obviously, lately, saying that he decided to run for governor uh, this year after Trump's presidential win and said that he thought it was important that Democrats offered an unequivocal contrast uh, to the president's political message. And what he said, he says, it has become, this is a quote, very clear that something was seriously wrong uh, and we couldn't take the ri the risk in Florida of putting another Republican light Democrat who would lose for governor the sixth consecutive time. He said in a recent interview, Democrats narrowly lost those races, he said, because of black, brown, and poor voters who feel they don't have a reason to show up with the nominees uh, that they have put before us. And I'm reading that from the Washington uh, Post. It's the Washington Post uh, right up there. What's interesting to me is uh, I think in obviously in 2008 and 2012 the African American turnout uh, was really strong for Barack Obama not as much for Hillary Clinton and maybe uh, African Americans people of color feel at yeah. this point that they have a reason to go to the polls now not as much for Hillary Clinton and maybe uh, African Americans people of color feel at yeah. this point that they have a reason to go to the polls now not just because of what Gillum is offering, but also because of what um, Donald Trump has done and this administration has done as well. I, I think that's definitely true. I will point out in the Democratic primary season so far, in fact, African-American turnout has been down relative to say where other uh, portions of the Democratic elector have been. But the one example of this past cycle in which African-American turnout was very high was in the Alabama special Senate election. And if Gillum can double down on that and repeat what occurred in Alabama, I think mm -hmm. that's a very good sign for him going forward. But again, in order to get African-American turnout up, you have to offer them something unique, something different. Obviously, Barack Obama did that in both 2000 and 2012. In 2016, Hillary Clinton wasn't able to duplicate that. And you saw the results in states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, and down in Florida. If Gillum can get that African-American turnout up, he, in fact, could conceivably sort of cross that finish line that Hillary Clinton wasn't able to down in Florida. And remember, Hillary Clinton only lost that state by a little more than a percentage point. And if you go back four years ago, that's about the same margin that Rick Scott won, the Republican incumbent governor, won that gubernatorial race. So if Gillum is just able to get a little bit more support, that could make all the difference in the world. And as my mama once told me, yeah. winning by one vote is just as good as winning by 100,000. I, 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 let me ask you uh, one more thing, right. because um, you know, he, he doubled his percentage, Harry, uh, within the, just a couple of weeks just before the election. I'm wondering how he made up that ground, especially, you know, he's uh, Gwen Graham, who is, you know, Senator Graham's daughter, a former congresswoman. I mean, that's um, <laughs> that was a tough road to hoe, and he he did it. I, he absolutely did it. I would point out, of course, that Bob Graham hasn't been a senator from that state for a very long period of time. In fact, he, although I'm a relatively young guy, I'm not that young before I was able to vote. So the Graham name in the state is not perhaps as good as it once was. I will say he got that late endorsement from Bernie Sanders. He was able to put a lot of money into social media. And I think those two things really were able to help him. He was able to pick up momentum. And one other thing I point out was the three leading candidates besides Gillum who were running for governor on the Democratic side, they all went negative against each other. And they were afraid against, of going negative against Gillum because they thought that they could not afford to lose the African-American vote in the general. So it was sort of this perfect storm that Gillum was able to ride and clearly it worked out for him in the end. Wow. Uh, making history tonight. First African-American major party um, yeah. winning this in Florida uh, right now. He's got November. He's got to go up.
you know, against a, a Trump supporter, yeah. but we shall see. It's going to be an interesting time. Uh, April, I want you to stick around. Harry, thank you very much. We'll get Harry back uh, as need be here uh, in the coming hours here on CNN. You know, tonight we're learning that uh, President Trump gave a stark warning to evangelicals at the White House last night, a warning of violence if Republicans lose in the midterms. CNN, listen to a recording of what the president said, a recording from someone in the room, including this. It says, quote, they will overturn everything that we have done, and they will do it quickly and violently and violently. There is violence. When you look at Antifa, these are violent people. So uh, April Ryan uh, is back with us, also White House correspondent Abby Phillip uh, as well. Abby, welcome to the program. Good evening uh, to you. This warning of violence, if Republicans lose the midterms, which is absurd on his face, um, this is scare tactics 101, right? This is fear mongering. I think that's right. I think this president has been veering in this direction for some time now. Uh, we have to go back to the point of all of this, which is that Republicans started out thinking they were going into the midterms with taxes being the major issue for their base, being the thing that they delivered to their voters. It turns out that is not working all that well. So what President Trump is leading his party toward is a message about immigration, a message about uh, Antifa, which he mentioned in that clip, uh, about the potential consequences for impeachment if Democrats are, are elected. And that's what I think he thinks is going to motivate his party. He has to scare some of his supporters to vote, which is why he held this event at the White House uh, last night. The, that event was about uh, Im Im you know, impressing upon evangelicals the importance of telling their flock uh, how critical this election can be and using all the tools in the arsenal uh, that he possibly can get in order to do that. Mm -hmm. And so fear is a really powerful tool. And this is a president who has been unabashed in using it uh, in politics since the very beginning. How many years have you been covering the White House, yeah. April? 21 and counting. Have you ever heard a president issue a warning like this? You know, I have heard presidents and their uh, supporters or, or their principals that are around them talk about, you know, the, the, the consequences if they lose, but never like this. And Abby is absolutely right. I'm thinking about the fact that every time this president wants to rally his base, he finds a common enemy to unify his base. And particularly, it's, it's interesting that he would say this to the evangelicals at a time when, you know, people question his morality. So he's going to take it off of his morality and throw this out there, this shiny ball, so they can focus on that instead of all the other stuff that's going on. But this president likes to play on fear. He likes to talk about, you know, uh, uh, Hispanic gangs. He likes to talk about Muslims. He likes to talk about different things, you know, uh, you know, the NFL football players, you know, taking the knee for because we don't like or, or, or black people are upset about the flag, which that's not the case. Um, he likes to gin up things to get his his numbers up and to make him look big like he's in charge. But what it does, it's causing fear and it's causing angst and division in this nation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, going back to what we just talked about, there could indeed be a blue wave. He is legitimately afraid of a blue wave, but to gin it up like this about Antifa and things of that nature, that's crazy. Um, it's just, it's just, it's, it's taking it to the nth degree. Well, and there is, a, and, and by the way, that don't adjust your sets, April. There's um, having a little satellite fade with your uh, with your shot there. So April face looks a little weird, but that is because of the satellite. Uh, but oh listen, my gosh! <laughs> yeah. Listen, there's you know the, there's a racial component to this because he is linking uh, Antifa to Democrats. But in that statement, you didn't hear anything because you know he is the first we heard of this president mentioning Antifa was for Charlottesville, right? So we haven't heard him mm. um, link neo Nazis to Republicans. So there is a appeal to racism here. Is he appealing to that? Well, I yes. think it, it is Most possible. Definitely. Go ahead. Go ahead, April. April, go ahead. No, go ahead, April. Well, well, yeah, actually, he is. This president knows his base. Uh, 
has a, a real issue with the, uh, the, the, the issue of race. Race is that thing mm -hmm. that makes this president tick. He started with birtherism and he's continued on and on. And his base rallies behind him, but it's dividing the nation. And he has not apologized, taken anything back. And it's not a good look for this, for a president of the United States. Yeah. And it's dividing the country when he says he's a unifier. Go ahead, Abby. Yeah, I mean, I think your point about Charlottesville and the connection with Antifa is is important because that's that is in a lot of ways where this has come from. In some ways, it is true that we've been talking about Antifa more often because these rallies that that have popped up uh, have popped up in some ways in the wake of what happened in Charlottesville. But to associate Antifa, which is an anti-fascist organization, closely with uh, mainstream Democrats is a little bit of a stretch. And uh, I think that in the wake of Charlottesville, the president had to find something else to talk about because his reaction to it was was panned both by Democrats and Republicans. So this has been uh, the thing that a lot of the president's base has held on to. And, and that's why we're talking about Antifa, not because Antifa is something that uh, is a widespread phenomenon that is a large, has a large following across the country, but because it is the counterpart to the conversation about how President Trump dealt with that particular moment in American history. It says it right in the name, Antifa. Antifa fascism which is what they were there um, fighting listen there's you know no organization is perfect there was some violence um, no one condones the violence but there were different reasons for Antifa and for these neo-nazis uh, to be there one racist fascists the other group fighting racist fascists there is a fascist there's a distinction there thank you both I appreciate it much more to come on our breaking news a huge upset in Florida where CNN projects Andrew Gillum has won the Democratic primary for governor. Plus, we're going to have more on our breaking news. President Trump reportedly talking again about firing his attorney general, Jeff Sessions.